Hello again. Let's talk about graphic narratives. In this lecture, I want to examine the way in which pulp fiction as a popular medium was growing and expanding in American culture and making inroads into radio and into the movies. But it hadn't yet appeared on the comic pages. And that is what this story is all about. Now, Pulp Fiction is really an outgrowth of the British pocket literature. We talked about chapbooks and penny dreadfuls. Now, Pulp Fiction is a little bit more substantial publication, still printed on cheap paper, still easily slipped into your pocket, still full of serialized stories that were sensational, sexy, and violent. And they dealt with these men of means achieving great works like the Scarlet Pimpernel, and then stories like science fiction John Carter of Mars, Jungle Stories, Tarzan, Adventure, El Zorro, Buck Rogers, most science fiction, The Shadow, Doc Savage. If name, any of these names sound familiar to you, you may be familiar with them as further spin-offs of them did occur, but this is the era in which they were coming into being, and this is the era which was fomenting interest in these larger-than-life characters and stories. Science fiction, which had started in the previous century, was really gaining speed. It was really pushed by Hugo Gernsback, who while really wanted to explore this genre further, and created amazing stories in 1926 to really look at what was possible in this new genre of amazing stories. Most Pulp Fiction, though, tended to be more salacious, and Harry Donafeld was one of the most uh, well-known publishers of these spicy mysteries, spicy detective, spicy anything and he would publish it. And his covers were really high artistic quality, always having some nubile nymph parading across this, the cover, being chased by some kind of terrible bad guy or frightened by some sort of bug-eyed monster. This is where Pulp Fiction lived. Now, now just be to make this clear, you may be looking at this going, Wait a minute, Harry Donafeld? Batman? Is this where the first Batman appears? Not really. Let me show you what was inside these Pulp Fiction magazines. They were illustrated stories. Usually at the beginning of a story, you would see some kind of picture to get you excited about the story and maybe one or two other pictures inside the text. But there wasn't a whole lot of illustrations, and it certainly wasn't a comic. This was Pulp Fiction, and it was made for adult readers, not for kids. Now, some people have noted that there are certain dark features of this story by Lou Merrill of The Batman uh, that may have been an inspiration for the later comic book character, which would appear just a few years later. So. It's a, poss a tantalizing possibility, but not a direct link. So one of the first Pulp Fiction heroes to make it onto the comic pages was in January 29th, was Harold Foster's Tarzan. Now, in the first year or so of publication, he really followed the action in the stories. It was like he was illustrating uh, the text from the imagery de Ipinal. Foster was an amazing artist. You know, just look at the anatomy of his illustrations, the drama, the excitement. He drew really large and had this work sort of shrunk down. Uh, it gave him this level of detail, this mastery of perspective that really created a lot of power. Foster really didn't want to be a comic book artist. He really hoped to break into the illustrating stories, but there was much um, jobs at this time. You're heading into the Depression, and he was happy to have a job. That said, he passed the job off to some other artist who was absolutely horrible, 
and they begged him to return. And within the following year, he took the job back and began inventing new stories based on the character Tarzan. Now, the other pulp fiction hero to appear in the same month, in the same year, was Dick Culkin's Buck Rogers. And Buck Rogers uh, was one of these science fiction fantasy stories. And it was really set in the 25th century. And it was just so outrageous and and outlandish. But what it had going for it was this kind of art deco design for the future. And the characters were very modern. We had this flapper-esque Wilma, who was the heroine to be rescued. And there was a sense of excitement and drama that was no longer, when you were reading it, it was no longer like you were looking at a stage play or a vaudeville act. This was something really different. There were flying cars and there were people jumping and and flying through space. There was a, a level of drama and excitement that was really quite different from your typical Sunday colored supplement. Buck Rogers' popularity spun off to create Flash Gordon by Alex Raymond in 1934, and this was a really high art achievement. Alex Raymond, like the Tarzan Foster, really knew how to draw and also worked very large and created these, these super dramatic compositions. Just love the way the hawk people are swooping down onto the scene. It's just an amazing tour de force of illustrative power that he had and brought to the Sunday pages. This kind of drama, which was really serious, finally came in. People were willing and excited to see what was possible with this new storytelling, serious storytelling, not jokey. Uh, stories. It was quite an achievement to bring into this, and this led to a whole host of new adventures and adventure stories in Sunday comics and in daily comics as well. One of the pioneers of the adventure comic genre in the newspapers was Milt Caniff, another extraordinary artist who was enormously prolific. Milt Caniff created Dickie Dare, and then was that took off, he decided to do something a little bit more edgy and went for Terry and the Pirates, sort of a sense of bad guys and, and femme fatales and all the sort of characters you might have seen in classic pulp fiction. He didn't really own Terry and the Pirates, and he was an enormously popular comic artist. But he eventually dropped this under an agreement where he could completely own Steve Canyon. And that was the comic strip he devoted all his energies to for the remainder of his life. And this was uh, his artistic tour de force, Steve Canyon. One of the things that we see with Terry and the Part, Milk Kenny, is a really sophisticated use of cinematic compositions. He's really looking at the way movies tell stories. Uh, You can sense in the way he's framing the scene, this is something from Orson Welles and the way he would create that kind of dramatic compositions in his movies. And you can see this really brilliant use of light and dark to create focus and drama in each panel. The other artist who was really successful was not actually drawing his own work. He was just a writer, Lee Falk. And he just spun out so many really memorable and exciting characters. And he continued to work on multiple strips throughout his long life. One of his early popular strips was Mandrake the Magician, who had this hypnotic power where, as you see, the the crooks uh, rushing at him in their car. He convinces them with a wave of his hand that the car is flipping over and the the confused crooks uh, drive off without causing any harm. And this was sort of a a superpower he has. He also is a, a guy with a cape and a top hat in a suit. He's really doesn't look like he belongs on the streets of New York City. He's in this sort of extra narrative, larger than life sort of presence. I I love the way the cape really brings drama to his 
presence on stage. And I think this is where we're really starting to see the idea of what's possible with this idea of a superhero coming into being. The way he gets it really close is with Lee Fox, The Phantom. This was enormously popular and was translated and transported all over the globe. The Phantom was this mysterious stranger who adopted the persona of the vigilante, the Phantom, who would fight against crime and all for this sort of higher purpose that he had been sworn an oath uh, in this in this way. So it's full of adventure and piracy and and across jungles and things like that. One of the unique features of the Phantom you see here with those white eyes in that uh, hovering around. He had the idea, he wanted to create the impression like a classic statue, not something looking back at us, but something eternal. At the time that Pulp Fiction was going into the newspapers, another device was being developed for communicating comics from the newspapers back to the public. And these were these early comic books. They were called half tabloids. So if you took a newspaper and you fold it in half, you would have a tabloid. And if you took the tabloid and you fold it in half again, you'd really have the size of a comic book, a half tabloid. And what they were doing was when the publishers who printed the newspapers had a day off in the middle of the week, they would keep their presses going by publishing reprints of the strips that were found in the newspaper. So you could buy for 10 cents a collection of comics that were in the newspaper. Now, this was especially valuable because if you missed a day of an adventure story, you might have missed a very important moment in that story. So compiling and collecting these adventure stories proved very valuable to a lot of readers. And they were willing to plop down 10 cents to see things that they may have seen mostly before in the newspaper. The Eastern Color, the one that began to publish these reprints regularly, starting in about 1934. And Max Gaines was the entrepreneur who really was pushing this idea of how to make money on this business model. And he was the one who first kind of put something that had been sort of given away as a freebie by companies. And he said, well, what's the price point for this? And he sort of tried out 10 cents and he found that they sold pretty well at that price. Now it's Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson who decides to enter into this reprint comic business, but he realizes that most of the good content has already been snapped up. So he decides instead, hire a bunch of hack artists who will draw whatever they can to make something that looks like a comic and kind of put it together. And he can pay them what it would normally cost him to get that reprinted materials from the newspapers. So now he was generating his own new content and he put out Detective Comics number one with this creepy Orientalist image on it. Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, a name who's a bit of a mouthful, he was not a good businessman, and he got perpetually into a lot of trouble. And eventually, his detective comics would be bought out. And we'll talk more about that in a while. One of the things that started to happen as a number of publishers wanted to make new comics with new content, the idea was that if it got popular in the comic book world, it could be sold to the newspapers, that they might be creating something for new content that could eventually be sold up to the newspapers. But the quality of art that was being produced in these comics was, was generally really shabby and not at all newspaper ready. One artist, Will Eisner, who would go on to great fame, really saw great potential in this new longer format of the comic book and really pushed his own art to experiment with ways to communicate stories in more dramatically exciting ways, now that he had multiple pages to work with. And you can see the way he's thinking visually about the composition of the page. Notice how the green arc of the frame of the door is echoed in the up next frame. There's 
Also, the way in which the angle of the character, the angle of the light, and the angle of the character echo one another. He's really trying to think about the whole page, not just sort of cutting things up, old content, and put it, pasting it down, but really thinking about what's possible in this new medium. So Eisner worked for this guy named Harry Chester, who was a packager. They didn't actually publish this stuff. They were just preparing content for anyone who happened to have access to a press and paper and ink and was going to make a comic. You can understand at this time, 1939, war years, there was all kinds of rationing, all kinds of problems putting out comic books. They were very irregular and it was really hard. And this was the bottom basement of the publishing industry. This was the down and out dregs of what it meant to be in the publishing business. And so this material they were working with was very much fly-by-night, going in and out of business all the time. Just for an example, here we see a typical adventure comic book, The Clock from April 1937. Now look at the artwork here. It's really wooden. And there's a strange way in which the clock's face is sort of blacked out with this clumsy mask. Notice how in the upper two panels, he first doesn't have a hat. Then he has a green hat. Then he has the green hat still there. And then the next panel, the green hat was there, is gone. You have to understand, these drawings were done so fast and so quickly. There was very little care to the idea of continuity or any kind of narrative coherence. It was all about just get it out there, have some fight scenes, make it exciting, and hopefully it will sell. One of the ways these artists worked when they were working fast was they would often use what they called swipes. They would be constantly scanning the newspaper pages for interesting body positions. So here is a drawing by Alex Raymond in 1934 and the comic artist Joe Simon. He swiped it, he had it in his records, and he would use it again and again in other comic compositions. And this was the standard practice. You didn't have time to have models hold poses and and draw from life. You had to make it up. You had to copy it. You had to because the demand for content and the price at which you were being paid just couldn't afford to go any slower. There were a lot of people who wanted to break into the comic industry. And two young kids, Siegel and Schuster, they were really fascinated with the idea of comic books, and especially comics in the newspaper. They had come up with an idea for this arch villain, the Superman. And then as they kind of developed their idea a little further, they started thinking more about him as a hero. Who would this Superman be? And here's the sort of the early promotional art you can see. He's got this, this shield with an S on it on his suit, and he's Clark Kent, a news reporter, someone who would be at the scene of crimes and, and act, action, but then he could, his mild minor persona, he could take that off and can become this super powerful man who could achieve great things. So this was a really interesting idea. We'll tease this out. Where did they get this crazy idea? Well, There was a story, a Pulp Fiction story called The Gladiator, about a guy with superpowers who had to hide from his powers because it it, it was something that would betray him. And so this idea of someone with power that couldn't be known directly. There was also a circus performer, a strong man, Breitbart, who went by the name Superman. And he was a, a quite short Jewish man. And he was really an incredible um, popular feature at the time. And, and both Siegel and Schuster went to see him perform in the circus. And this idea of their own Jewish identity is probably also at the core of Superman, because there is a long tradition of the story of the Gollum, this powerful man who is uh, brought to life so he can defend the young and the innocent. And so these are all parts that go into this original character of the Superman. But when they tried to sell Superman to newspapers, and they tried for many 
years, like five, six years, they were they were going around selling, sending it to every single newspaper and every single comic book publisher. Everyone rejected it time and time again. Their art just wasn't polished enough. The story was just a little too ridiculous. And they did get work eventually doing other things, other ideas they had. Dr. Mystic, the occult detective, was one of their early comics that they got to publish. And you can start to see them working together on creating ideas of action and suspense stories. It wasn't until Harry Donafeld had bought Detective Comics and he was looking for some new material. He wanted something really splashy for his new comic book, Action Comics Number One. And it was a small editor in the book who had looked at Superman and he said, I think this is interesting. And it was this impetus to give it a chance. It's different. This costumed character jumping around, saving the day. And they decided to give them a job. Siegel and Schuster went to work for Harry Donafeld. They had a job. They were thrilled. They were kids just out of high school, and they were finally broken into the business. They sold their character, Superman, for $130. And they were so excited to be working in the business. Superman, as we all know, becomes a phenomenal hit. It's a story of this young child who is, uh, escapes the destruction of his home planet and sent on a rocket ship and lands on Earth, where because of the change in gravity and the physics on Earth, he has now, he was an ordinary person on kryptonite, and now he is this super powerful person. And this is the thing that's really quite fascinating. He's like Moses. He's been abandoned, but he's also, in many ways, this idea of the immigrant that's coming in, someone who is from, not from this place. He's like the space explorer, John Carter of Mars, who goes to Mars and has superpowers because of the difference in the gravity there. But now it's gone back the other way. He's returned to Earth. He's a domesticated space hero. And this is the thing that makes Superman so original and really quite a novel uh, super character. Needless to say, there were lots of things that got fleshed out in the early years. The stories of Superman, his super strength, his, the death of his parents, and his determination to fight crime, all of which were right there from the very beginning. <laughs> 